record now, if that's all right with everybody. Okay. Hello, everybody. How are you doing? Uh, good, thanks, Mariana. Excellent. So, did you manage to get the, um, the links on the... Um, I've been posting the links on the, uh, let's say, blog. I'll put it on here so you all know. And if you are not um, part of this, I suggest you probably will send around Oh, at the end of this, I can probably send, send using the chat, like another invitation, because for me, it's very easy and it doesn't take any time just to upload the links mm -hmm. over here. So then if you want to look at the cases before uh, these rounds, and then it's very easy. I'll put, I'll put that on our, um, on our app as well so that people can access it, like go back and access it if they don't have time to do it when they get the link in the chat. Awesome. Cool. So there are two very interesting cases. I think they're going to be, uh, we, we'll see how far we go. In the beginning, I named this one 11 and then 12 because I was thinking about dealing with the 11 first, of course. But then I think I changed my mind and we are going to go with the number 12. Um, and the history is pretty short. and. I, I think it's, it's, I'm not making that up. I think it's real. It's just like incidental, almost an incidental finding. So it's a 10 year old Burmese and the history is reduced appetite. And I'll share the link. So for those of you that didn't get the image or the link, now uh, you can open it now. Okay, so you should be, you should be getting that. And I open the images here, so we can share that case. As, as usual, I put the images up here. You take a look, and then we start bringing all your your thoughts. You know, all what you think is abnormal. And I'm all, already taking my paper and my pen, so I write down you know, all your comments. I think it's a challenging case. And I think, um, as I mentioned before, I, it's not that I love making mistakes, but I find mistakes so in, in learning that I, I don't think I got this one I think I got most of, most of it right, but not all right. That's why I like to share it, because it's almost sharing a mistake. And if I share a mistake, I'm sharing a learning situation for me. So, yeah. I'm gonna just comment, start with the obvious. There's a full yep. in the caudal, caudal mediastinum. Okay. So what do you want to, uh, how do you want to, there's an abnormality. So basically you, um, the localization, you think whatever is abnormal is in the colomiastinum. I, I think so, just because it's shifting the heart to the right. Okay. Okay, I, good point. Ball. And so then we can even be more specific, we can say, that is in the dorsal yeah. caudal mediastinum. Mm. The lungs are very patchily aerated too. Um, I'm going to ask you to. The, there's uh, air there. there. Okay. But it's uh, radio dense there. Okay. Okay, we leave it there. Um, and then we'll try to answer to give an explanation. So probably we'll say that there is an increased opacity. 
I would add, I don't know, tell me if you agree or not, it seems to be a poorly defined. It's, it's not like a sharply marginated. It's not, it doesn't look like a, <laughs> we go back, an, like an odule or a mass. It looks like, if, if anything, there is an increased opacity over that hemithorax left. Cool. Anything else? Sorry, Mariana, I, I missed the, what, what was the signalment of this case? Uh, reduced appetite. What's that, sorry? Reduced appetite. Like, okay. just not doing well, not eating a lot. And how, how old is the patient? He's a 10 year old child. Okay, thank you. D6 feedback. So it's pretty much, so I tell you the real, uh, everything is real, but like more detail. This was a cat that I think was meant to have like a dental. Um, and then the radiographs were taken just to make sure that there were no other incidental findings before like a pre-anesthetic uh, set of radiographs. And then when the vet took these images, he said, oh, wow, there is something going on here and I'm gonna send them. So he sent me an email and said, what do you think about this? I, I still have the cat on the table, what should we do? So it's pretty much incidental. Makes sense? So it was a dental. I, now, while I'm talking about this, I'm probably I'm thinking that the vet thought that the reduced appetite was related to the dental issue, probably. Makes sense? So this is pretty, pretty non-specific, older cut, take a radiograph for another reason, and then we found this. It could be, but in my experience, a, a lot of animals will still continue to eat despite the fact they've got rotten and painful mouths. Yeah. Um, is, is there also decreased serosal detail in the abdomen? Or is it, yeah, is it that abnormal? Can you, can you point out where, where you think Um, so more so in this area, I suppose. Does that show? Okay. <laughs> um, okay. and it looks like the colon's almost kind of diving ventrally quite quickly, um, kind of here as well. Yeah. But that could be reading into things too much. Oh, well, I, I see what you mean and that kind of calls your attention, you know, some, somehow you, you put your eyes in there. But, so let me argue a bit back. Yeah, cool. um, well, with the idea, I see what you mean about the ventral deviation of the colon. However, I can have a pretty good idea where the kidneys are. And I, can, I think I can see the cause of the kidney very well. And even those little, like, soft tissue tubular structures, which I believe is probably the columnar cava, one of them, even sometimes in cats we can see ureter. So whatever is happening there is probably not due to free fluid and probably free fluid in the retroperitoneum, which will be, which will result in the ventral deviation of the colon. But at the same time, it should result in loss of detail. Makes sense? So mm -hmm. we should not be able to see the kidney. So I see what you mean. It's striking for me as well. Uh, that is, sounds like, or looks like unusual, that ventral deviation of the colon. However, when I try to explain why, in other words, can I see a mass or can I see a collection of fluid in the retroperitoneum, I kind of fail. So then I probably put less attention on that and maybe put it as a, a variation. Like cuts uh, are a lot more flexible, makes sense. Things move around a lot more and they collect like fat in different places. So in my mind, I will probably explain this out, make sense, by saying there is an unusual collection of fat in the retroperitoneum. Is it also, I'm sorry. That would be my thinking. Is it also because there's um, not really any obvious gas in the stomach and um, anything okay. contrasting in that area too? So it may look oh. more like that? Very good. So that, that's a, I, I think, is a, an excellent point. 
uh, I'm interested in how you're going to use that, but that's a very, it's extremely, extremely important point. So we, we can't see the, the stomach and we usually see the stomach. I mean, unless it's extremely small and doesn't have any gas inside, which is a pretty unusual situation. Usually the, the stomach has some degree of gas. And what, what, the reason why I'm saying gas is again, because of the same principle as always, it's so easy to identify gas that we rely on that gas to, to identify the stomach. So um, I agree with you. At least there is a big question mark there. What is happening with the stomach? Why is that I can't see it? However, that doesn't really explain your ventral deviation of the colon. But it makes sense because no, no, no. in my eyes, they are separate, probably separated, but it's an excellent point, your point. So stomach, we put a question mark. Okay. Anyone wants to describe that? We, we left the um, kind of an abnormality in the caudodorsal mediastinum and probably with a, with a shift to the right. Anyone wants to describe that abnormality a bit better? Because by, by forcing to describe something, we are going to narrow down, like for example, if we think, I don't know, um, edema, lung edema. Do you think this is lung edema? Makes sense. A, a lung edema could result in increased opacity in the caudal thorax, probably not in the mediastinum, but in the thorax. Why is this not that case? And the reason is because something in the lung, lung edema, is going to have ill-defined contours. And this seems to have very well-defined contours. What I'm trying to say is that the, the more effort that you put in trying to describe that abnormality, then the easier is going to be to then go for differential diagnosis. Make sense? So, and we describe things by, it's always the same thing. So when you are lost and we say, well, I don't know where to start. I'm, I'm quiet. I don't know how to go forward. Size, shape, opacity, contours, number, and location. Make sense? So, mm -hmm. What's the size? What's the shape of the abnormality? What's the opacity? What the contours? What the number? What the location? That's it. We 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 can never go any further than that in anything we do in imaging. We don't know about function, so we just know about morphology, and those are very key, very easy features, uh, just to describe. Make sense? Size probably I can measure that. Uh, what about the opacity? You can say vessels through it. Um. Along. What do you mean by through? Ah, uh, uh, or overlying it. The, the vessels are, uh, are, are visible. Um, so uh, the, it's also in the position where the esophagus would be. I mean, if it was a different shape, I'd suggest it could be a mega esophagus. But it, to me, it's it's too well blown up and consequently more likely to be a mess. Okay, all good points. Can we, first let's define the opacity of that. And then we go into the problem with the vessels. So if I need to ask you, you know, what, the, what is the opacity of that structure? Where are you gonna go? There are not many options. Soft tissue. Okay. Very good, soft tissue. So it looks like soft tissue. We will see that then, then probably we can make a little, a little distinction, but it looks basically soft tissue. So if that is soft tissue, and we can still see vessels that they are here, I would use the word superimposed. And that should recall, I told you that we would be talking about superimposed and silhouetting and the grapes and all of that every time. So, my question is, do you think those vessels are within the mass or outside the mass? Outside it. Yeah. It has to be outside. Because if the mass is soft tissue and the vessels are soft tissue, if there is any vessel within that mass, we should not be able to see the vessels. Well, it could happen. That doesn't mean that doesn't really mean a lot in the lateral projection because th that could be within one lung and we have superimposition of the vessels on the other side. Make sense? And in the lateral projection, it's still gonna look like superimposed. Superimposed, 
against bore effacement. Make sense? So a vessel within that structure should bore efface, soft tissue, soft tissue. Now, if you have a soft tissue, those are the vessels that are surrounded by air in the lung. Now they're superimposed, uh, two grapes separated by air, and now we can see the contours. So probably moving on, is soft tissue is in the caudal, caudal dorsal mediastinum. Um, what about the contours? Are they ill-defined or well-defined? Fairly well-defined. They are very well defined, which is, in my eyes, extremely important point. Um, now we are thinking we are thinking about diseases that can result either anatomically or based on the disease process in well defined contours. So, if someone thought about something like, I don't know, contusion in the lung or something like this, probably you should go back from that idea because those diseases like edema, contusion, like an alveolar pattern in the lung, or even fluid, if we go back to the mediastinum, just fluid will not have that very well-defined contour, unless fluid is contained within something, okay? So contours are well-defined, it's soft tissue, it's they call dorsal mediastinum, um, and then it has a mass effect. Do you agree with that? Do you agree with the idea of the mass effect? Yes. Do you see that even even the main bronchi here, uh, probably that is is I, I would bet this this is in contact with the heart, and probably the, the cardiac ciliary is also displaced cranially, and here is going towards the right, um, and there is a shifting of the heart to the right, so it's it's acting like a mass, it's pushing things around. I have one more. So probably I'll tell you. Do you see the difference in opacity? So I think the contour of the mass comes here, and then here is hard to hard to follow, and then there is an increased opacity. In my eyes, is in the lung here, and the opacity of this lung is different from that lung. My my interpretation of that is that that mass is compressing the lung, and when you compress the lung, that lung is losing some gas and there's a telectasis, and if there's a telectasis, there's increased opacity, and if there's increased opacity, now it's more soft tissue, and if it's more soft tissue, silhouettes with that mass. Makes sense, that would be the thinking that I would have. But it's at the end of the day, the mass still has well-defined contours, and I think I can justify that loss or poor definition of the contour by saying that there is something in the lung, most likely a telectasis. Okay. I go back to the to the here the, the comment about the increased opacity. I think here, tell me if you can follow me. Do you see that line? That line continues on and it goes over the abdomen. And there's another one here, and then there's another one here. Those are beautiful examples of skin folds. And then they go over, and because the skin fold produces an increase in the thickness, make sense? Then you have an increase in opacity, but it's not within the thorax. It's, it's on, the, on the surface, it's on the skin, and it's producing that increased opacity. And the way out is like in any line. So any time we are dealing with this superimposition problem, is, is that what we are looking at in contact with other thing, or is it within a cavity or not? Continue the lines. So if the lines go out, is very likely a superimposition. That is, is always a good tool. That's how we get out of those problems. So by me being able to continue that into the abdomen, then I don't think that's a real structure within the thorax and within the abdomen. That has to be on another level, and that is a superimposition. Okay, so now we are left with, I think we have the right to call that mass because of the well-defined contours. So we can start to narrow down our definition or our summary. So this mass is in the caudodorsal mediastinum and is producing a mass effect to the right and we don't see the stomach. So now it's time to start trying to explain. And what we do now is in my eyes the, the fun part of imaging, which is what we call hypothesis testing. Makes sense, we, we throw an idea and we say, what if it is this? 
and then we see how well it fits. Makes sense that we may find that it doesn't really fit, or there is one of the features that really we you know we can't explain. So then we need to throw that idea away and then bring another idea. So this is kind of the creative part. So any any ideas, any theories, makes sense. So now any hypothesis. I think just based on the um like this really sort of smooth um spherical border, it looks like an out pocketing from something and given its position and mass effect on the heart, maybe it's out pocketing from the diaphragm. Okay. Mm. So then you, you would call that a hernia? Possibly, yeah. Potentially something like along those lines. Like a hiatal hernia or something? Mm. Okay, hiatal hernia. So now we are more specific. Um, Is there any, I think if we hypothesize about a hiatal hernia, for example, now we not only can explain that abnormality within the thorax, but we can also explain the, or the absence of the stomach in the abdomen. So the theory that I can explain the most features is usually the winner, makes sense? Because if you can explain just two things and then you leave one out, that theory is worse compared to one that can, in, can bring all of the abnormalities in the same uh, bag. So uh, I like that idea. So we leave it there. I have an argument about against that idea, but we leave it, and this is how we play, makes sense? So we, we put an idea, we say, with this idea, I can explain this and this, until someone comes and say, well, but if that is the case, then what about that? Makes sense? And so I'm keeping one card to play to go against that idea, but it's a good idea. So we have a, an actually explains many things. So the absence of the stomach, the location is in the caudal mediastinum, caudal dorsal mediastinum, the stomach is not there. So it's beautiful. So hiatal hernia is one. Any other? Near pleasure. Okay, where? Um, yeah, good point. Somewhere in the mediastinum. <laughs> Good. So, what are the structures that we have there? Um, so, it could be like a sarcoma or something like that, connected tissue structure, or I suppose it could be from um, even like muscle tissue as well, like a myosarcoma or something like that. Yeah, what, what has muscle there? Sorry, what's that? Which structure has muscle? Muscle, the diaphragm and the, and the cardiac. And what else? And the esophagus. Excellent. So, the dorsal masses, mediastinal masses, unusual, unusual. There are not too many structures. They are a lot less usual compared to something, let's say, in the craniovental mediastinum, where we have the lymph nodes, thymus. You know, they have, it's a lot more common. So, up there, not that many structures. So we usually blame the esophagus or, or a hernia, for example. So, yeah. So I like your idea. It could be a mass. In my eye, I would probably blame something esophageal or parasophageal. If I, now I'm thinking, if this would be a dog and it's in the Caribbean, I would be thinking, for example, about a spirocerca. I don't know if you have that here. Um, and I don't think cats get it. I get it, and I'm not sure about this, but that would be an example of a paraesophageal, a, a mass in the caudal dorsal mediastinum. Or as you mentioned, a sarcoma from the esophagus, but it's pretty unusual, but it's a good point. So mass originating from the esophagus, you know. Okay, anything else? Jeff said earlier, maybe megaesophagus, but could that be located just like, um, in the caudal aspect only, I'm not sure. Okay, so that it would be pretty unusual. So um, based on the direction of flow, so either the esophagus is all, all uh, affected and it's usually in the same way, or the dilation occurs more orally. Makes sense because you have the flow of content and if you have an obstruction then accumulates orally. Um, so, 
Then the next question is, what do you think about this? Is something that is the elephant in the room? We haven't mentioned that, but we should have at least thought about trying to explain or trying to assess how is the esophagus in the cranial thorax or in the thorax? Can we see? It? Is we can't see it makes sense because if we are blaming something in the caudal mediastinum, the esophagus is, is one of the important structures. And then the question is. What do we think about the esophagus? So we are coming, for a minute, we are coming back into the description because we need to assess what, what do we think about the esophagus? Well, we can see it there. Mm. We can see it there. I'm not sure. I, I tell you where I think it is. And you know, that means that I'm going to be right, but um, uh, annotate. Here we go. So, first point do you remember that we should not be able to see the outer contour of the tracheal wall. So, if we see the outer contour, it means that there is something gassy on the other side. So, for example, down here, we don't see the outer contour of the wall of the trachea, we do see it here. So I think there is some gas in the esophagus, but I think the dorsal wall of the esophagus is probably, no, no, here. And I, I could be making that up. I'm, I'm not 100%. But I don't think it's distended up to here. If anything, is up to there. That's what I was meaning, but my experimentation Wait. with the drawing contours. Wait. Didn't work very well. <laughs> awesome. Good. Good. Okay, so let's continue. Until now, we have a hiatal hernia, we have an esophageal, we have a mass probably related to the esophagus. Anything else? Can we put abscess on the list? We could put an abscess in the list. I think we probably we should. Anything else? Probably the spirocerca idea. And again, I probably need to go and check if cats get it. I don't think so, but um, it could be the idea of a granuloma. In sense of, you know. Anything else? Otherwise, I start bringing some question marks to the hypothesis. What I don't like about that um, hiatal hernia is that I would expect it to be on the left. I would honestly don't think it should go, and this guy wants to go to the right. Make sense? He's pushing things to the right. It's not that it's just by, by chance. Make sense? He's, he's really going to the right. And the esophagus should, he goes to the left. So if that is within the esophagus, more centered on the midline, a bit more to the left, I don't know why it goes to the right. That doesn't fit in, in it's small detail, but really doesn't fit. And the other thing that doesn't fit is that if this is really the wall of the esophagus, and if this is a, a hiatal hernia, well, it, it could be probably like this. So then this is the sphincter. This is the, the gastroesophageal sphincter. Okay, so that, that, that probably, that, that could work. What I don't like is, is to the right. Um, as far as circa, uh, Mariano, is, uh, uh, it's been reported in non-domestic felids, but in the domestic cat, it's rare to non-existent. Good. Mostly a parasite of dogs. Yeah. Okay. And then I think the esophageal mass or the, the something is still there. I still have the problem about going to the right. I don't know why it wants to go to the right. And... Yeah. What to do next? I don't think we can go move a lot further. I would, if I need to list or bring all of these hypotheses and try to uh, prioritize, I think the, the thing that we can't find the stomach, and not only here, but here, I think is extremely important. So I think I would put way, way high any type of hernia, something 
try to put these things together. Try to say, whatever is in the thorax is coming from the abdomen. I, I mean, I don't know why it goes to the right. That's a question mark that I have. It's not, it's, it's not that I expect that, but it has to be a hernia top. That, that should be the top differential. And I've been wrong many times, so I would have a defensive comment saying, you know, I could be wrong. The stomach could be very small, and we could be dealing with, in a 10-year-old animal, we could be dealing with a mass. And because it goes so much to the right, I, I mean, I think it's unlikely, but I think we probably should consider a mass in the lung as well. We've been very convinced about the mediastinum, but that is way to the right. So I, I would probably have that as a, as a comment more than anything, considering it's a 10-year-old animal, and if the mass is slowly growing, probably not clinical sign. So I, I would have that in the back of my mind or as an unlikely differential. And the next question is what to do next? You know, how, how can we get closer to the diagnosis? And the diagnosis is pretty, is can, can we confirm that that is in the esophagus? You could do a contrast study? Absolutely. That, that would be a, a easy, cheap way to figure out what is happening. And we have different expectations. So if that would be something outside the esophagus, then we should see the contrast going like this and probably, probably displaced, but not going into some, like a big sac. If this is a gastroesophageal interception, oh, that's the other differential that it came out of my mind unconsciously. If this is a hiatal hernia, um, then contrast should, once it goes in here, it should go into a cavity. Makes sense that that will be the stomach. So it would really look different. The other differential that we haven't considered that I, I consider at the time, because of these contours so well defined, was a gastroesophageal interception. So is the stomach herniated, not herniated, is the stomach within the esophagus. So this is, this is a different situation. It's not like the gastroesophageal sphincter moves cranially. I know the stomach moves cranially. This, the esophagus stays in the same place, but now the stomach goes within the esophagus. In terms of imaging, again, it shouldn't go to the right, but it looks very much like it. The problem with that is that it's usually an, an emergency situation. It's usually not an incidental finding. And as far as I know, it has been described in dogs. So I remember thinking about that. And then when I go back to the history, I say, well, I, think, I don't think I can rule it out, but I think it's a lot less likely. But that would be another one. And contrast will look extremely different. Contrast will go like we've, saw, we've seen in the previous rounds. Contrast will go around that abnormal stomach that is in the esophagus. So contrast will help us anyway. Um, good. So contrast is a way to go. There is one point that I want to mention now that came to mind, uh, thinking about the option of a hiatal hernia, sliding hiatal hernia. And it's the opacity of that structure. It always looks too much soft tissue. And it usually when there is a sliding hiatal hernia, you know, the stomach, that's gonna be the fundus of the stomach most of the time, has some degree of gas. Makes sense? So that's an, another unusual thing in this case. Okay. We left it there. I think I remember calling the vet and saying, some kind of hernia. Um, we should do contrast for that, or or a lung mass. Those are a lot less likely. Those were my two considerations. And the way to move forward, I think we thought about contrast, and then we decided to go for CT because we said, well, we want to get to the bottom of this case. We probably are better off putting the animal under anesthesia, doing CT, and then we take a look at the CT and we see we need to sample or, or do something else and we are just ready to you know, answer the question and go with it. So now I'll, I'll show you the CT. Unless you have a question. Would, um, would fluoroscopy be of any use here as well? Absolutely. It's, 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 you just, it's the best way to do the contrast in a case like this. I guess while I study that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, here we go.
So I'll give you the um, false contrast and probably, so I'll, I'll go cross and then we, then I do reconstructions, okay? And I will, I will pause this as well. So then you can go through the images. I think it's a beautiful teaching case. Okay, so heart, lung, aorta. So even if I don't go further, what do you think about that? Looks more like fluid. Are you sure? No. Go, go here, you know, always the same. This is soft tissue. This is muscle. This is? Ah. Yeah. Up to there, which is already supporting our idea of a hernia. Make sense? The fat there. No, that's not fat. So what do you think? Is that ruby? Like those? Yeah. So this looks like the spleen, triangular the soft tissue well defined and this is the fundus of the stomach with all the rugae and enhancing a lot and that is actually what was in the in the thorax make sense and if we come back this is what we thought was atelectasis in that lung make sense so this is the normal opacity or attenuation of the lung this is more like soft tissue that's the airway and it's obviously being compressed similar to the Colvina cava and if you compress, you lose gas, and if you lose gas, the opacity increases. So interesting, interestingly, it's very nice to see how that, those structures are not just going into the thorax and in between structures, like in between the lung, like in the pleural space. This is, this is in the mediastinum, and it seems, as you, someone mentioned before, it seems to be contained within a sac. Which says it's contained within something. It's not, it, it's not that it wants to go with the lung or in between the lung, so it's contained within something. And then see, that, that's the connection. Now we go into the abdomen. Almost all the stomach is in the thorax and almost all the spleen, but not all of it. So this is more of the spleen. I will make a reconstruction. Uh, I have the same problem like the other day where I can't, This will be like that. I have the zoom tools in front of the other tools and I can't do a reconstruction. Let me see if I can do it here. Um, so frustrating. I'll do it here. Cool. Okay. Okay. I think this image is pretty cool. And then we are gonna review our hypothesis because I think we haven't mentioned the real diagnosis yet. So I think this dorsal view is very cool. Um, you see the interruption in the diaphragm and then the herniation of the stomach and spleen and fat. And then it seems that everything is contained within a, within a sac. So based on this, what do you think is the diagnosis? I'm starting to think it's a pleuroperitoneo uh, diaphragm hernia, which more common in Persian cats, and I don't remember what breed this is. And how is that different from? So let's let's go back to the hypothesis that we had. So the first one, let, let let's let's bring back the hypothesis of a hiatal hernia. Why is this not a hiatal hernia? And now, now I may lose some of you. This is this is a 
it's a it's a thin discussion. Make sense? Now, now we went almost all the way to the answer. We know that it's not a mass. We know we know that it's not a ground loma. We know it's not an abscess. We know that it's not in the lung. Now we are discussing between small differences. Okay, so which type of cranial are we talking about? So this is a discussion about more more small things. Um, so let, let's go back and think about the hiatal hernia. Why is this not a hiatal hernia? A sliding hiatal hernia? Or can we tell? What, what, what would you do? Which element would you consider to think if this is a hiatal hernia or not? Is it where, where it's emanating from? Where is it coming from? Um, what do you mean? Looks like the, um, yeah, to me, it looks like it's coming from there. But. Okay. I'm going to bring a drawing that I've been preparing for this because I knew we would end up in this. So the a hiatal hernia would look like this. And so this is the diaphragm. This is the stomach. Uh, the key element to to assess in this case, again, we are walking now. Now we started with not knowing where that was and many different hypotheses. Now we are narrowing down to we know it's a hernia. Now we are in between. You know which type of hernia. So in that discussion, then a sliding hernia, hiatal hernia. The key element is that the uh, gastroesophageal sphincter moves in in. Make sense? So it's that is the, the anatomical structure that slides in, in cranially. So if that is the case, then we need to try to find this and decide, is this move, has this moved cranially compared to a situation like this, where that esophagus actually goes into the abdomen, but then there's another part of the stomach going and we call that paraesophageal. Makes sense? So it's, it's not that the sphincter went in and within when the stomach, but the sphincter is in the normal place and then part of the stomach went on its own. Make sense? Or, or next to parallel. That's why it's called paraesophageal. Okay, so this is the little bit of a distinction that we need to make. So is this the case or is this the case? I'm wondering how the spleen got in there if it's a, an esophageal or hiatal hernia. Okay, so the spleen gets in there because it's attached to the stomach. So I think it, it can, depending on the size of that, um, it's a hole or interruption in the continuity, you know, the, the spleen can go in and it can go in, in even in, in hiatal hernias. It's just because it's attached and it can go. So if we go back and keeping this in mind, I think now we are dealing with this situation. So let's try to figure if we can see the, the um, esophagus. So I think probably this is the esophagus with a little bit of gas. And I think, oh, let me see. Again, this is, this is small. I hope I don't lose all of you. So that is the esophagus here. That is the esophagus. And then the question is, is that, where is the gastroesophageal sphincter? So if you keep going caudally, the esophagus I think comes here. There, 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 and it gets into the, sto into the abdomen. And then from there, I think it goes into the stomach. So if, if you take that, um, I'm probably the image should be something like this. The esophagus comes like this, goes into the stomach, and then this goes parallel to the esophagus. So this is a paraesophageal hernia. And apparently, I was reading about that congenitally, they can either go to the left or to the right. And when they go to the right, they are the true um, mediastinal hernias, which is the only situation. Usually, otherwise, they break the pleura, and then you go into the pleural space. This is the only true one that actually 
goes into the mediastinum. That's why it looks so mediastinal. And now we know why it went to the right. Makes sense because anatomically, the esophagus was on the left. And I suppose the esophagus was preventing that mass from displacing to the left. Makes sense. And it, 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 then it was easier for the mass to go to the right. Unusual, unusual. In the beginning, I was also wrong, and I thought it would be a, a herniation through the foramen of the Colvina cava, which is also unusual, but it can happen. The, the reason why now looking at the images again, I don't think this is the case, is because usually in those situations, the liver is the one that gets herniated, not so much the stomach and the spleen which is a very, very common or expected thing in a paraesophageal hernia. So coming back to the comments, this is, there is a, a congenital defect in that diaphragm. So coming back to the case, actually, if we go back, I'm really questioning in a 10 year old cat, if this is just an incidental finding and probably we are missing something else makes sense that is the beginning of the story i think it could it could be but not necessarily we may be missing something else and i went into the abdomen and the pancreas looks a, a little bit funny so i wonder if this is all an incidental finding the cat has been living like for 10 years with this uh, likely i don't think we know for sure because the defect could have been there and then probably recently had something going in so it, these are all hypotheses the good news is that I think the, dog, the animal, the cat, he had surgery yesterday, and I asked the vet to take photos. So hopefully next time I can show you some photos and we can know exactly or if he found something else in that abdomen. That's a cool. Did the cat have respiratory distress? No. No, not that I know. And why are you asking? Well, um, without respiratory stress, it's like it's been there for a long time and the cat's just used to it. Okay. I thought like if it was an acute thing, then the cat would present with, um, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Interestingly, I remember when I looked at the radiographs first, I was a bit concerned because in my mind, it looked so similar to Astroesophageal interception, and those were like those are emergencies. So I remember talking to the, to the vet, and then he was a lot more relaxed. He said, "Oh no, he was just taking radiographs like for for a dental." So I said, "Well, so then you can wake the cat up, and then we do a proper workup." Because I thought it was like I was even thinking, "Oh, send it under anesthesia, and then we figure out what is going on, and we continue today." So th that's not the case, but. At the same, even though it's not a gastroesophageal interception, the stomach is the one herniated. So I wonder, like through the history of this animal, you know, if, when the cat ate a lot, or if he learned how not to eat a lot, because if he ate a lot, he couldn't breathe. I mean, that thing is in the thorax. So anytime you make the stomach larger, th there is going to be a space that is occupied by the stomach that is up, taking up, you know, room from the from the lung. So it's interesting how. Either the owners got used to the cat being quiet after eating, makes sense, more than any other cat, I don't know. Uh, but it's interesting that this is, this is a 10 year old animal. Marianne, okay. we, we, we yeah. did have a case of a juvenile cat with a gastroesophageal intersusception. A few years back. Cool. Um, which was pretty cool. Cool. We did, yeah, contrast swallow with that one. And you could see it really nicely. Absolutely. So that's why I, in, I, let's say I, I mentioned the contrast because it's actually the way to go in situations like this. It's, it's, it's easy. This was a little bit of an exception because the animal was under anesthesia. So I will not do contrast with the animal under anesthesia, concern about aspiration pneumonia. And I think, wrong or right, sometimes we have, we know that we have CT or we have cross-sectional imaging, and we know that, you know, we almost, in some cases, 
take the shortcut and we go directly to what we think is the is what we get us out of the out of the question. But if you go purely, if if this is a case where the animal is awake and you take a radiograph and then contrast is the way to go, it basically is gonna answer all your questions. I, I it's hard to see a situation where you are not gonna know. Uh, I guess in a situation you may still be with a question mark, but in most of the cases is the way to go and it's easy and it's cheap. So I'm thinking about if we're leaving anything to discuss. I was prepared to show you all the other types of hernias. Uh, so probably just for fun, I'll show you. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna screw them. Makes sense. I'm gonna save them for another for another um, rounds. But probably the one that I can um, bring out just to cover these minutes that we have left. Um, is um, let me see. this one, which you're gonna enjoy, and it's easy. And I don't know anything about the history. This is just uh, just to show you an example, a radiographic example of another hernia and another congenital hernia. So, what do you think? like ventral diaphragm, diaphragmatic hernia. Okay. But then, yeah. sorry, I was gonna say, but then on the DV, we've got this really nice kind of margin here, like it's contained. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you think it may be contained? I think it's in the pericardium, but I can't believe how many guts got in there. Yeah, yeah. So we this is a, Peritoneal pericardial diaphragmatic hernia. And see the, the heart is elevated and it seems to be everything contained. So I, I would take that line. See, that, that line, and it's symmetrical and it goes from one side to the other. It cannot be uh, an, like a, a herniated structure. That, that's, it, that's the pericardium. And then all of this went into the pericardium, all the small bowel. That, so the presence of the small bowel, oh, something that we can do as a take home message is review a little bit what are the features of hernias. So just, just as a review situation for next time we deal with this hypothesis of the hernia. So the easiest is if you have an interruption in the continuity of the diaphragm, makes sense? So you don't see the diaphragm. The problem with that, is that there are many other situations where you don't see the diaphragm, like pleural effusion. So that's one of the features. Then the strongest feature for a hernia is this. It's having structures that belong to the abdomen in the thorax. Make sense? So that's the easy. And the easiest situation is to have, because you recognize it easy, is to have a gas-filled structure. Make sense? So this is the case. Then you, you then you try to decide where is it? Is it in the pericardium or is it in the pleural space or whatever? But they, no one can argue that this is small bowel is in the thorax. Therefore, there is a hernia. You know, so that that's the easy situation. So you have displacement of abdominal structures into the into the thorax. You identify them. Period. Now things can get more complicated because if you are not lucky enough to have either either the gas filled stomach or gas filled small intestine. Now you deal with things that look look more like masses, makes sense because they are soft tissue. So it's harder to pinpoint or identify. So then we go into the indirect evidence of hernia, which is cranial displacement of abdominal structures. So they don't need to be herniated. Makes sense. So if the stomach is cranially displaced, then you that is a supportive evidence. It's not conclusive evidence because it could be the delivery is small. But if you keep adding features, makes sense. So if you have interruption in the continuity of the diaphragm, cranial displacement of abdominal structures, and cranial displacement of thoracic structures, all of those are indirect evidence. Make sense? It's, it's almost like a mass effect situation. 
without you being able to see, because the other thing is that sometimes there is a hernia and sometimes there is fluid in the, in the pleural space. So you just rely on indirect evidence. So I, again, the easy is to see the rupture of the diaphragm and the herniation of gas field structures. That's the easy. It, it's not always there. So when we go into the difficult, we go into indirect evidence, and that is cranial displacement of abdominal structures and cranial displacement of thoracic structures. Like in this case, the heart was displaced cranially a little bit. So you actually follow the rules. The problem with this indirect evidence is that they are not uh, exclusive. Make sense? They are not, uh, they could be due to other things. Like a lung mass can displace a heart cranially. You know, it could. Or something other than a hernia could displace a stomach cranially, like a small liver. So now we are relying on, let's call them hints. They are not hard evidence. They are little hints. And then we may need something else, like contrast. Uh, you know, and then it may be, like in this case, the stomach wasn't gas filled. It was hard to see. Uh, if we had contrast, we, we could have seen the, the stomach cranially. By the way, something that I wanted to say is that I show this to a friend, like um, a radiologist, and he, without knowing, I really enjoy that. When we, I show him the first image, he picked on this. He said, there is a line there. I think there is fat. And I think maybe there are two structures. So good, good for him. I think he went really further and he really questioned that opacity. And I think he's right. I think that is the fact that we see in the CCT. Radiographically, you come back and say, well, if that is real, then probably there are two structures rather than a mass. And then that's a positive of a hernia. But again, I, I wasn't, I, I, I didn't go that far when I looked at the case first. Okay, hopefully, yeah, we, we, the, the last part is a lot more technical, is, you know, the detail, detail where, you know, which type of hernia it is, hopefully you enjoy that. I, I, that for me was the cool thing about this case. This case forced me to go back and read all the hernia classification, makes sense? And because you want to give the, the, the person that is gonna do the surgery, like, trying to anticipate what that person is going to find. That's why I went back and study all, review all the, the hernias and, and try to communicate and anticipate what the person is going to find. So at the end of the day, my diagnosis is a paraesophageal hernia that it went into the mediastinum. And I question the clinical relevance of that. And we will know more hopefully next week. I think they had, had surgery yesterday and we will see. Cool. Thanks, Mariano. Such cool cases. <laughs> it seems that you have a cold, I know. Oh, my allergies are shocking, actually, and I've run out of antihistamines. Oh. oh no, it's so frustrating. Sorry about blowing my nose the whole way through. Um, anyway, I'll pick up some antihistamines on the way to work today. <laughs> um, Good. Thank you so much, for everybody, for coming, and Mariano, again, for such cool cases. Um, I'll load this video up onto the app as usual in the next couple of days, but I'll also put the link up um, to join the forum um, for discussion and we'll just keep the discussion going over the next week or so until we see Mariano again. And Mariano, can I just confirm we are going to be doing regularly rounds at 8 a.m. on Tuesday mornings from now. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. Wednesdays. All of, all of everybody's rosters are changing, so rounds are going to be a bit more unpredictable this week until we get regular roster, and then once we're in regular roster again, I'll, I'll get a bit of a rhythm going and, and put the roster up so everyone knows. But the next rounds will be Alan Lai, surgical rounds at 8 p.m. tomorrow evening. Thanks, everybody. See you guys later. Thank you.